Thank you. So the next item of business is a statement by Derek Mackay on the medium-term financial strategy. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so <clears throat> if anybody would like to ask a question, I would encourage you to press your request to speak button now. And I call on Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, I'm very pleased to set out the Scottish Government's first medium-term strategy. This budget, uh, this marks the first step of the new budget process proposed by the Budget Process Review Group and agreed by the Parliament. It's also an important step in the development of the fiscal responsibility of both Government and Parliament following the 2016 Scotland Act. And we must remember that Scotland's public finances are set in the context of continuing UK Government austerity, Brexit uncertainty and an inhumane, hostile approach to immigration, all of which present unnecessary risk to our economy and our tax base. Despite increased powers over taxation, the block grant remains our single biggest source of funding and it continues to be cut. Between 2010-11 and 2019-20, our discretionary block grant for day-to-day -day spending is falling by £2.6 billion or 9% in real terms. In 2019-20 alone, we expect real terms cuts of £410 million. Presiding officer, let me be clear. The UK government does not need to pursue this course. Austerity is a choice and it is one based on ideology, not on economic necessity. The Chancellor is on course to overachieve his own fiscal deficit target. So the OBR confirmed in their economic and fiscal outlook in March 2018 that the Chancellor has around £15 billion of fiscal headroom in 2020-21 alone. So rather than continuing his programme of cuts to public spending and tax cuts for the wealthiest, he should, as a minimum, invest the headroom available in vital public services and economic stimulus. Between now and 2022-23, Scottish Government modelling suggests that the Chancellor could provide additional investment in Scotland of around £5 billion, while still meeting his own UK Government targets on structural deficit and debt reduction. UK austerity is a choice, and it is not one that Scotland has made. And I continue to make the case to the Chancellor. He should change course end austerity and invest properly in public services. Leaving the EU is not in Scotland's interests either. It is also not Scotland's will. Uncertainty is currently leading to subdued growth and leaving the EU compounds that impact. The UK government proposed approach in immigration could see real GDP in Scotland 9.3% lower by 2040 reducing tax revenues and threatening public services. In the face of the damaging role the UK government is playing in Scotland's economy, this strategy sets out alternatives and also how the Scottish government will deliver our ambitious programmes. The UK government still has time to rethink their approach on austerity, on Brexit and on migration. And indeed, it appears this is a week for Tory reflections. This strategy clearly lays out the consequences of UK choices imposed on Scotland and how alternatives would mean a fairer deal for Scotland. And against the backdrop of UK austerity and uncertainty, our decisions have sought to ensure that we manage our finances responsibly and provide people and businesses with certainty, including through our actions on taxation. Our approach to taxation is founded on the four key principles of certainty, convenience, efficiency, and proportionality. These principles have shaped our reforms to income tax and LBTT, which taken together will boost our spending power by almost 500 million pounds a year by 2022-23. Our policy ensures value for money for our taxpayers and certainty for our vital public services during the turbulent and uncertain times ahead. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government will always be ambitious for Scotland, no matter what is happening elsewhere. Growing and supporting the economy is essential for financial stability and essential to provide the resources for our public services. 
Over the lifetime of this Parliament, we'll invest more than £20 billion in infrastructure. The Scottish capital budget for 2018-19 is estimated to support around 40,000 jobs. We'll bring superfast broadband to every home and business across Scotland by 2021 through the R100 programme. We'll invest £1 billion to support city region deals for Glasgow, Aberdeen, Inverness, Edinburgh and the southeast of Scotland. And of course today we secured new deals for Stirling and Clackmannanshire and we continue to work on the Tay Cities deals as well as other growth deals. The Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme will fund large-scale projects to deliver Scotland's energy strategy. And this year, the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work budget increased by £270 million. That's a 64% increase, forming part of our total investment of over £2.4 billion in our enterprise and skills bodies. And we're committed to making Scotland a great place to do business, providing the most attractive package of non-domestic rates in the UK, including measures specifically designed to boost investment and support sustainable economic growth, such as the Growth Accelerator. And alongside our economic focus is our support for the social contract. We'll invest in our treasured NHS by adding £2 billion to the health resource budget over the course of this Parliament. We'll protect local communities by maintaining the police resource budget in real terms each year. And we'll ensure the best start in life through a transformative expansion of early learning and childcare, nearly doubling funded provision to 1,140 hours per year. And we'll tackle the attainment gap with three quarters of a billion pounds through the Attainment Scotland Fund. And we'll ensure that education is based on the ability to learn and not the ability to pay maintaining free tuition for university students. And we'll deliver dignity and respect for all by shaping and funding a distinctly social security system in Scotland. These commitments are at the heart of our social contract and at the heart of meeting the outcomes in the new performance framework. Our strategy sets out funding estimates needed to meet these commitments over the next five years. And today, the Scottish Fiscal Commission will publish new economic and fiscal forecast, which suggests that economic growth will be lower in Scotland than the UK over the next five years. However, when the effects of population growth are stripped out, Scottish growth is much closer to UK growth. This underlines the importance of this Parliament having greater control over immigration. Yeah, yeah. The SFC. The SFC have also produced updated tax forecasts which show a more subdued outlook on income tax revenues, largely due to their assessment of the recent wage growth and their conclusion that earnings will grow more slowly in the years ahead than they thought in December. As they describe it, this is their main evolution in judgment since their last forecast. The SFC also confirm that the costing of our income tax policy, which remains largely unchanged since the budget bill, is expected to raise over £210 million in 2018-19. Our strategy shows that income tax is projected to contribute over £400 million a year in net additional revenues by 2022-23. These forecasts are used in our strategy to create a central scenario of potential available funding. It then goes on to set out potential upper and lower scenarios based on this central estimate. This provides an indication of what funding may be available to the Scottish Government. By their nature, these scenarios and the forecasts that underpin them contain a degree of uncertainty as new data becomes available they are very likely to change. As I've already set out, a significant degree of that uncertainty comes from the lack of clarity over the path that the UK Government intends to take on both austerity and on Brexit. So when we set the 2019-20 budget, we will have a further set of economic and fiscal forecasts from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, updated <coughs> block grant adjustments from the UK Government and the outcome of the UK autumn budget, all providing a more robust set of information on which we will make our budget decisions. And similarly, we do not currently have any resource budget allocation from the UK Government beyond 2019-20 and it is hoped that the UK spending review next year will offer sufficient future year 
budget information to allow the Scottish Government to develop multi-year budget allocations. So the medium-term financial strategy does not provide detailed budget allocations at this stage. That will form part of our annual budget process. But on any scenario, we have to operate within the fiscal framework and the UK funding policies. And I've set out in this strategy our responsible approach to financial planning and fiscal rules, which will allow us to invest in the economy and protect essential public services. And I hope this strategy informs a responsible debate on budget choices in Scotland, and I commend it to the Chamber. Thank you. We now have around uh, 20 minutes for questions. We start with Murdo Fraser to be followed by James Kelly. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Finance Secretary for the advanced sight of his statement and welcome this new initiative of the Scottish Government setting out its future plans for the public finances for parliamentary scrutiny. Can I also welcome the, the unexpected but very generous uh, recognition by the Finance Secretary of the success of the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the UK Government's policies in delivering more progress and deficit reduction than was previously predicted. It truly shows the UK Government is in safe hands. Now, Presiding Officer, <laughs> Presiding Officer, the contrast between the UK Government's progress and the dismal performance of the Scottish economy relative to the rest of the UK after 11 years of this Government could not be more stark. Last year, our economy grew at half the rate of the rest of the UK and slower than every single EU country. We heard last week from the Scottish Government's officials that for the four quarters of 2017, the Scottish economy met the criteria for a Scotland-specific economic shock due to our underperformance relative to the rest of the United Kingdom. And today, the Scottish Fiscal Commission predicts that economic growth in Scotland will be lower than the UK average over each of the next five years. And despite all his protestations, the Finance Secretary cannot blame this on Brexit. It hasn't even happened yet. These problems predate, predate even the Brexit referendum vote. But, Presiding Officer, let me ask two questions of the Finance Secretary. The Fiscal Commission have predicted a more subdued outlook on income tax revenues than they forecast previously. So what will the impact of this be on the block grant adjustment in each of the next five years? What does this mean for overall spending over this period? And what will the impact be on public services? And secondly, in rejecting austerity, as he says, will the Finance Secretary now reject the super austerity in Andrew Wilson's Growth Commission, which would cut public spending in Scotland by £27 billion over the next 10 years? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, oh, 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 on, on a point of uh, consensus, because we might as well try and begin with that, at least I think it is a, a helpful evolution of the Parliament's processes to publish such a document and then, of course, will be subject to extensive scrutiny, I am sure, at the Finance and Constitution uh, Committee uh, in due course. There's a lot in what uh, Murdo Fraser has said. First of all, I wouldn't take it as any comfort that the Chancellor has fiscal headroom when all it will expose is that the Tories will continue with austerity for its own sake rather than having fiscal loosening to be able to invest in the public services of the United Kingdom and Scotland. And my analysis shows that in, they could meet his own targets eh, but unlock £60 billion worth of investment across the whole of the UK and that would benefit Scotland to the tune of £5 billion. Why on earth wouldn't the Scottish Conservatives support such an injection into Scotland's eh, economy? So it would be a matter of choice if they don't take that path eh, that I've proposed eh, in this eh, strategy eh, document. Let's reflect on the positives and the strengths of the Scottish economy. Record high employment, record low unemployment, and the SFC forecast that that trend uh, will absolutely uh, continue. In terms of 2016 economic growth, it was disappointing at 0.2%. 2017 was a stronger year at 0.8%. Contrary to what the Conservatives said about my tax plans, the reasons behind the subdued forecast from the SFC is about population and productivity. Who controls that? the UK right-wing Brexit mad Tory government that are trying to keep me in a fiscal straitjacket so I can't deliver the kind of economic growth that Scotland would wish to see. You see, the Tories are in denial once again, but your ministers in UK government, ministers in UK 
government have admitted quite clearly that they've got a responsibility towards Scotland's economy. When asked by Drew Henry, MP, uh, to the Secretary of State, referring to this nation in terms of economic growth, does he accept that uh, he has responsibility for growth in the economies of all the nations of the UK? Greg Clark, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, says, I do indeed. So it's funny the Tories in the Scottish Parliament say that the UK government has no role in the economy of Scotland. Fundamentally, we have a sound basis in which to grow our economy. In terms of the question around uh, impact on the Scottish budget, of course, the figures that were used for the Scottish bu budget are locked in. The forward look will depend on the final forecast coming from the OBR, coming from the SFC by law uh, before the budget is actually decided uh, by the end of the year and into next year. And of course, there are issues around methodology um, as well. But crucially, the UK government cannot walk away from the ABC of the Scottish budget. A, austerity. B, Brexit. C, caps on immigration. That is what is subduing the Scottish economy. Indeed, as well, <laughs> the Tories say, no, it's not. Maybe they should read the Scottish Fiscal Commission yeah. report uh, yeah. when, they, when they see it. Because it is clear, when you strip out the population effect of the analysis, Scotland's growth is much closer to UK growth. And, you know, we've proposed a budget that invests massively in the economy, all opposed by the Scottish Conservatives. The only thing the Tories spoke about in the budget was tax cuts for the richest and taking £500 million out of the public services of Scotland. And there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that the tax divergence is having any negative effect on the economy. In fact, it is levering in, it is levering in new investment for the public services of Scotland in the fashion that we clearly set out. Tory, I mean, clearly the Tory memo hasn't quite got to Murdo Fraser yet on their current tax position in terms of tax cuts uh, for the rich. So the UK government has a choice here. The Scottish Conservatives have a choice here. They also asked about the Growth Commission. Can I tell you that austerity is the price of the union, not Scottish independence. You see, what this, what this? Oh, 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 I've been asked if I've read the Growth Commission. I was on the Growth Commission. I helped contribute to the 354 page report. And it's abundantly clear the Tories haven't read it because actually, maybe the Labour Party might show some ignorance on this as well. The Growth Commission, if it was followed, would show real terms growth for our public services as opposed to the cuts that have been imposed on Scotland by the Conservatives, which will continue if they choose not to follow the path that I've most reasonably suggested this afternoon. I appreciate that the Minister wanted to lay out quite a lot of the detail of his argument there. And there is quite a bit of room available this afternoon, but perhaps not that much room if uh, we can make some progress through the questions. James Kelly to be followed by Patrick Harvey. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance copy of the first speech that he made this afternoon. Uh, last, week, last week we had the SNP Cuts Commission. Today we have Derek Mackay's Cuts Forecast. The SNP continue to pile the agony and the pain onto Scotland's communities. The announcement today will give no comfort to patients waiting for hospital appointments, to parents where schools don't have enough teachers, to passengers stuck at railway stations waiting for trains that do not turn up. These SNP plans are timid, contrasted with Labour's bold proposals which would invest <laughs> in public services and grow the economy. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when is he going to get off the fence and start taxing millionaires at a higher rate instead of hammering Scotland's communities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President officer, I apologise for going on at length. I just had so much to say and I, I, I could go on, but quite simply, if James Kelly wants more time, he'll, he'll certainly have it before I appear before committee. 
Uh, the strategy sets out the fiscal plans for Scotland. Yes, it does set out the challenges we face as well, thanks to Tory uh, austerity. But what it does is propose alternatives to that path. And I would have thought even the Labour Party could welcome unlocking billions of pounds for Scotland's public services. In relation to tax, the tax measures I, I have deployed uh, are intended to accrue more money for Scotland's public services, not the Labour reckless, incompetent uh, 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 alternative budget, which would have meant less money for Scotland's yeah. public services. And if you want to talk about the NHS, education, police, fire, local government or any part of public expenditure in Scotland, read the document and read how we will put our commitments into action in the face of Tory adversity. But it doesn't need to be this way and that is the case I'm making as Finance Secretary. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Rennie. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, and I'm also grateful for the advanced copy of the, the documents. The, uh, no, nobody would expect this, this document, this five-year strategy, to lay out specific, precise commitments, budget line by budget line, for each of those years. But for many subject areas, in broad brushstrokes, there is a range of scenarios set out for health, social security, police, higher education, attainment, and so on. No such scenarios are given for local government. And, and I have read the document, as Mr uh, Mackay asks James Kelly to do. I think we've all read the document already. It doesn't set out those scenarios for what will happen to local government spending. Is that because local government is in line for deeper cuts to come over those five years? And will the Scottish Government give us a, a nice big long speech now about how we should be decentralising economic and fiscal power, giving councils the ability to make meaningful economic choices that are right for their own local circumstances? Local tax reform has to be part of this response. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think it's important to say, uh, first of all, I think I've reached my threshold of uh, long speeches, uh, presiding officer, but quite simply, what the uh, financial strategy is intended to do is to set out our commitments. It, all these commitments are clearly in the, the manifesto or, or have been developed over the course of our uh, time in government since the last Scottish Parliament um, uh, election. And uh, you know, we, we could debate the investment in, in, in the local government. The last two-year budgets, as a case in point, show in real terms increases for local government in the current financial year. Uh, the, forward, the forward outlook expresses the key priorities of the Scottish Government, the policy commitments that we've made, and of course local government does feature within that. A simple uh, answer to the question, uh, does this in any way represent uh, any prospect of severe cuts to local government? No, it doesn't. But what it sets out is how the proportion of the the proportion of the uh, budget uh, aligned to our key commitments expands uh, over the course of the next few years. And clearly, we're trying to address the problem of austerity at source here, hence the, the, the direction of choices to the Conservative Party. Yes, this Parliament will have choices to make, and I look forward to the budget discussions with all the political parties in the Chamber. And yes, I am open to further discussion on local taxation, which is totally in line with everything uh, I've said before. Willie Rennie to be followed by Ivan McKee. Willie Rennie. Uh, can I thank the Minister for an advance sight of his statement. Uh, these forecasts are not just subdued, they're, they're grim. The Minister failed to answer the question from Murdo Fraser about the precise cost of the downgrade from the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So what is that figure? And secondly, will the Minister take advantage of the £600 million of emergency UK borrowing if the GDP figures on the 24th of June are as poor as last year? Well, first of all, I think it's very uh, clear that we should all clarify that the, the forecasts uh, uh, will, will not uh, project us ever meeting the criteria over this period. On, on the forecasts uh, that are being released, we won't have the criteria, we won't be in such a scenario, so that um, uh, revenue support uh, uh, will, will not be available in terms of the, the GDP growth. Uh, in terms of the number right now, the reason I pointed out the complexity of the fiscal framework in the situation is that the point at which we determine the budget, eh, of course later in the year, eh, will be determined by the latest OBR forecast, the SFT forecast at that point in time, the block grant adjustment. You know, I, I hear a Liberal Democrat member say, just give us a figure. You clearly don't understand the fiscal framework and the complexity of the situation. All matters that are taken into account it will be taken into account as we approach 
the budget. And the methodology it will clearly be subject to scrutiny. The analysis the SFC provide will be subject to scrutiny and all the drivers behind it. Uh, OBR will already have to revisit their figures because the actual outturn is already diverging from the forecast. So I'm expressing we'll do it in a prudent way in accordance with the timescales within the fiscal framework. And I'll return to the Chamber in that regard. In terms of a reason to act, though, there is absolutely reasons to act on the economy of Scotland and make the necessary investments. And there are a list of interventions we're making to grow our economy. And I hope I have the support of the Chamber in doing that, because yes, this does raise the prospect of difficult years ahead if we don't grow the economy in the fashion eh, that is required. But that is why productivity, participation, and population are all central to our strategy. And we do, we do need the, the further levers to, to optimise our position in that regard. Ivan McKee to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Ivan McKee. Thank you. The uh, block grant remains the single biggest contributing factor to the Scottish budget, and this strategy shows that it will continue to be under severe pressure for years to come. The Cabinet Secretary has made it clear that UK austerity is a choice, not a necessity. How much more money would be available to the Scottish budget if the UK abandons its austerity obsession? Well, e even keeping within the Chancellor's own targets, I've been able to express in the strategy and the, the outlook that if he used the fiscal headroom at his disposal right now, as a minimum, that would generate an extra £60 billion of additional investment over the five-year period to 2022-23, uh, compared to current UK budget plans. What does that mean for Scotland? £5 billion of extra investment. The document goes much further than a range of other funding disputes that we have with the UK government, but that is a minimum. It could be transformational in terms of the public services and investment and economic stimulation of Scotland. Adam Tompkins to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank Adam you for joining us. So the um, Fiscal Commission today predict a much more subdued outlook on income tax revenues than they forecast only three months ago, such that by 2022, according to the figures that the government has just published, this will, be, this will lead to a £400 million shortfall. Does this not rather underscore the Cabinet Secretary's folly in maxing out the Scottish Government's credit card in the first year that it was available to him? Cabinet Secretary. Abbott, from the, from the party that says in every other debate, raise less because have tax cuts for the rich, but spend more in every single debate, the current position of the Conservative Party also now appears to be spend less on capital. Now, it's true to say I fully utilise the powers uh, of the borrowing powers, but it's to help invest in the infrastructure of our economy, to build houses, to invest in digital, to ensure that we can keep people in employment and prepare for the future in housing and transport and infrastructure, on childcare, on all of these things. That's the economic stimulus that comes hand in hand with capital investment. And we will stay within our own fiscal rules in that it regard and we will borrow responsibly and we will use in a fair and prudent way the powers we have at our disposal. Surely even the Conservatives would support that approach. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Neil Bibby. Presiding officer, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how much additional money will be raised as a result of his tax policies over the period of the medium term financial strategy and if he agrees that we should continue to prioritise our health service rather than tax cuts for the rich? Yeah, I, I do agree with that proposition, and I think I've got a new convert in Ruth Davidson um, as well, if, if she believes what she's saying. But based on the central scenario presented in the medium-term financial strategy, Scottish taxes will raise almost £2 billion more than the associated block grant adjustments over the MTFS period, uh, which for clarity is 2016-17 to 2022-23. Neil Bibby to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, to improve public finances, we need to improve economic growth. The SNP's big idea is the Growth Commission. Mr Mackay said himself he was a member of that commission. For clarity, therefore, I can ask the Finance Secretary, does he agree with all of the recommendations and full contents of the report? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, I'm in a curious position. I've been Chair of the Party, Finance Secretary and on uh, the Growth uh, Commission. But let's just say that... Let's just say... Uh, that not only, not only I was part of it, I, I've read it, which is more than I can say for most opposition uh, members. Um, the, 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 the important point here is that ultimately the, the Commission's trajectory shows that we could deliver real terms growth for the public sector um, as well. See, the GELS figures right now are a reflection of the current, the current constitutional arrangements, not what we could do with independence. So here's a wee secret. I support Scottish independence because I know what it could Surely. unlock 
for Scotland's economy, for our people and for our uh, democracy. But you know what? You know what? Short of having that, this government will clearly do the best we can with the tools at our disposal. But what I've tried to outline clearly, and the Scottish Fiscal Commission, a substantial and exhaustive evidence in that regard, will show how many of the barriers to our economic potential are actually in the hands of the UK government that are totally undermining our economy through the ABC. Austerity, Brexit and cap and migration. So I think it does lend weight to the argument that we should have independence. But no matter what, this Scottish government elected at the last election will do the best we can to protect Scotland, mitigate the impact of Westminster uh, uh, decisions uh, and try and move Scotland forward. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, President. I'm pleased about today because it, it marks the day of the, the, the agreement between the Finance and Constitution Committee and the production of a medium-term financial strategy, which I think is a good advance for Parliament. But in the meantime, um, Cabinet Secretary, the medium-term financial strategy rightly outlines a range of scenarios for Scotland's finances. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that we're far more likely to achieve the higher end of those forecasts if Scotland is not dragged out against her will of the European Single Market and Customs Union, and what are his views in regard to the impact on the economy of lower migration as a result of the e UK leaving the EU? Cabinet Secretary. I, I do uh, I agree with all of that, and of course I, I've put in the range of scenarios because I'm quite sure that if I hadn't, Bruce Crawford and the committee would have asked me uh, to put in a range of scenarios, but they are only uh, that uh, scenarios. Uh, but they all tell a story about the choices that we have and the UK government has um, as well. In terms of the negative impact that Brexit will have on Scotland, the leaked UK government papers have vindicated what we've been saying in terms of the impact potentially on Scotland's economy across a range of sectors. A, an interesting figure, of course, that has been vindicated, that if we are outside the European single market or we're not secured free trade agreement, we could see Scotland's GDP around £12.7 billion pounds lower uh, by 20 30 than it would be under continued EU membership. Now, that's equivalent to a loss of £2,300 per head each year for every person in Scotland. Alexander Burnett to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I note my register of interest. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the move to uprate business rates by CPI instead of RPI is permanent and not just for the 2018-2019 financial year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, this government in Scotland that's delivered that change and the Tories voted against it when you didn't support uh, the budget when I presented it to the Scottish Parliament. I'll approach each budget year to year if the Conservatives want to engage constructively with me in a budget, and that's a Tory ask, then I have some clarity. Uh, that's a wee bit more attractive to continue with that decision that I have made uh, to move the poundage uplift uh, from RPI to CPI. Um, so if that's an ask from the Conservatives, I thank them for that clarity. Each budget is taken year to year, but I certainly do want to ensure that we continue to have the most competitive package of business rates anywhere in the United Kingdom. John Mason to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you. The EU funding in, in various ways has made a significant contribution to the Scottish economy. Has the Cabinet Secretary had any guidance or confirmation from the UK Government about uh, the future of the equivalent of EU funding, for example, for universities, for agriculture, for structural funds? Cabinet Secretary. It's very, it's very mixed, and some of my colleagues are engaged in other discussions in relation to the future beyond Brexit and transition phase, but essentially very little, and it's still uncertain as the UK Government uh, negotiates uh, horrendously badly uh, with uh, the European uh, union. So I don't have any long-term certainty, and that's a problem because it creates uncertainty for farmers, for educational institutions, for uh, research, uh, for, for other schemes that have benefited handsomely from uh, EU-derived uh, funding. Now, if we're not careful here, if we don't get security over the package, the totality of resources to Scotland, uh, then we may well be uh, witnessing just daylight robbery uh, by the Chancellor into Scotland's resources in terms of what we should be entitled to in terms of the flow through of money coming back from uh, the European Union. So we need a bit more than a slogan on the side of a bus and something a bit more substantial on the forward look for the fiscal guarantees for Scotland in that regard. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Presiding officer, the Scottish Fiscal Commission's updated forecasts I think make for very difficult reading. 
subdued income tax revenues, meaning cuts to public services. And I know the Cabinet Secretary was not keen to give us a figure. Let me suggest that it's in the order of a cut of £1.6 billion. We also see GDP revised down overall um, and a poor performance extended to 2023. Um, so a bad set of GDP, GDP figures revised to be even worse than they were before. So it's clear that Scotland's economy faces a grim outlook and this government's failure to grow the economy will hit our public services. So let me ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will his government stop being complacent, drop the referendum chat and instead focus on growing our economy? Cabinet Secretary. I, I say again in relation to Jackie Bailey, uh, austerity is the price of the union, not independence. We're yeah. making a very clear, yeah. <laughs> a very, a very, a very clear, a very clear case on why more powers enhances the economic and social prospects of the people uh, of Scotland. But let's, let's, let's move back a stage from the glorious day when we have independence. Let's, let's stick to the here and now and what is the government doing right now. We're investing a record amount in city deals. We're investing uh, an increase in the economy, jobs and fair work uh, portfolio. There's a 70% increase in investment in business R&D. We're delivering a new National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. We're proposing to take super fast broadband to every part of Scotland. We're investing uh, record sums on infrastructure now opposed by the Conservatives. Uh, we're creating the Scottish National Investment Bank. We're building a new uh, Building Scotland Fund. We've got the most competitive package of business rates anywhere in the United Kingdom. But of course, of course we want to be able to do more, and surely Jackie Bailey would support us in that regard. Now, actually what the SFC uh, have said is that our view of the Scottish economy has not fundamentally changed since December. The outlook for subdued growth in Scotland over the next five years, the drivers of this are modest population and productivity growth. So why on earth wouldn't Jackie Bailey support us in having more tools to tackle that which the SFC has identified? Population growth and productivity growth. Come on, Jackie Bailey, you know better than that. Two more brief questions if we can. Stuart McMillan followed by Dean Lockhart. Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, President Officer. Also, the Cabinet Secretary has outlined that the UK Government's net migration target could cost the economy some £10 billion in the long run. But can he outline the positive contribution that has been made to Scotland's economy and Scotland's public finances from immigration? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, as the First Ministers expressed, they're indeed net contributors to Scotland's economy, as well as all the other benefits that uh, immigrants and immigration brings to our, our country. But on average, each additional EU worker coming to Scotland adds £34,400 to GDP, and that's £10,400 towards government revenue per head. So a very welcome net contributors to Scotland's economy. And Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Based on today's numbers, the Scottish economy is now projected to underperform the rest of the UK for 14 of the 15 years of SNP government, well before Brexit. Is this what Derek Mackay means by being ambitious for Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I've got news for Dean Lockhart. The UK economy is also underperforming in relation to the rest of the EU and comparable <laughs> uh, nations. I really do think that Dean Lockhart should, should, should get on side with the UK government and try and ensure that we get a better deal for Scotland. I look forward to the scrutiny of this strategy to see why it is the Conservative oppose our efforts to grow the economy, why it is they, they oppose our efforts to, to grow our population, to see why it is they want to put barriers in the way of further uh, enhancing the, the rate of productivity and economic growth. I think the Tories will have some explanation uh, to do on why they would choose a different path to what I'm proposing, which could unlock, even on the Chancellor's own targets, £5 billion for Scotland, as well as a whole host of interventions. So we've outlined an ambitious programme for Scotland that tackles both economic and social issues in the face of Tory Westminster incompetence. So it's about time that the Tories back the Scottish Government in having the powers and the ability to get out of this fiscal straitjacket to be able to deliver for the people of Scotland. And surely, surely the Tories, if they believe in economic growth, will help give us the tools to do that job. Thank you. That concludes our ministerial statement. We have run slightly over time, but uh, I wanted to get everybody in there.
Now, we're going to move on in a second to the next item of business, which is a debate on housing. Uh, before the debate begins, however, I'm required under standing orders to decide whether any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether or not it modifies the electoral system or franchise for the Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in my view, no provision of the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, it does not require a supermajority at stage three.